be damned if the same politicians who refused to act then are going to try to come back today. The real content of any kind of revolutionary thrust lies in the, in, in the principles and the goals that you're striving for. When the powerful use their position to bully others, we all lose. A system of justice will be the richer for diversity of background and experience. <laughs> Hello, everybody. It's me, Miss Cracker. I'm here with my co-pilot, Caitlin. And it's time for She's a Woman, which I just learned is the most popular, most downloaded podcast that I personally have ever made. Okay, so. good. <laughs> <laughs> She's a Woman is a podcast for every human being who looks into the mirror and says, She's a Woman! And for the people who love them. Every week, we talk to incredible women of all kinds from all walks of life and invite them to share their stories with you, our incredible listeners. And that's exactly <laughs> what we're going to do today, Craitlin. Craitlin, how <laughs> are you feeling? Um, I'm okay, I guess. It's a nice day outside. It is. It is a nice day out. We didn't have to wear coats. We're just wearing our little sweaters. I have a question for you, like I always do every single week. Okay. And today, since we're having a chef join us for this episode, I want to know, what is your favorite home-cooked meal and why? I have multiple answers. Oh, wow. I think. Usually she's stumped. This week she has multiple answers. Well, I was stumped at first and then a couple came to mind and now I can't narrow it. So, oh, wow. you know, okay. I love Ms. Cracker's chili. Yay. <laughs> uh, and then I love my mom's pineapple upside down cake. Does that count as like a meal? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And my grandmother's monkey bread. Oh, wow. I think those are like the three that when I think about eating them or when I'm eating them, I like feel comfort. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I get that. My mom makes chicken adobo, which is like this really spicy chicken that you make on the stove. And I can't remember, I can't re recall if it has like soy sauce or something mm -hmm. in it, but it's just really delicious. And it's all in one pot when it's made and you have it in a nice bowl with rice. And there's something about a sauce and chicken and rice that just is so comforting. Makes you feel good. Yeah. 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 But you mentioned what your grandma makes, and my grandma makes a sheet cake with cinnamon on top that is all, like, 90% butter, of course. Yeah, and, yeah. And it's just, like... It's it so good. <laughs> yeah. And then with my grandma's monkey bread, it's, like, I have all these memories of us making it together and it being so good. And then I make it as an adult, and I'm like, oh, it's so good because all of the sugar and butter that's in it, that's why it's so good. That's why it's so delicious. But now I'm, like more aware of it. So I'm like, wow, this is a lot. This is a lot of sugar and calories I'm putting into my body, but it's okay. Yeah. It's a treat. It's know? a treat. Yeah. You deserve <laughs> it. It's funny that food can bring back so many memories and feelings and just make you feel comforted. Yeah. That's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Only our chef today that we're going to talk to is going to talk about healthy comfort food too. Okay, so, good. We need that clearly. Which we need. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I want to dive right into our serious groundbreaking interview for the day. But first, I have a little treat for you. A little treat for you, Caitlin. Every week, we do a segment called Here's the Good News, where we share positive stories torn from the headlines. The idea is that they'll bring you, our listeners, a little hope during these difficult times. And this week, our news is all about progress, Caitlin. We talked about this a little in the cab ride on the way over. Yeah. And you pointed out that we have to word it very carefully because it's I very... don't want people to go buck wild. Yeah, and, we don't you want know. To... So this is from the CDC. Okay. So we, we can rely on it. The CDC is starting to announce new guidelines for people who have been vaccinated. They are allowed to gather in small groups privately, even though they need to wear masks in public like everyone else. And they can pay visits to those who haven't been vaccinated yet. That means fully vaccinated family members can visit unvaccinated healthy relatives without masks or physical distancing. Fully vaccinated friends can visit unvaccinated buddies. So there's a little progress in the pandemic. A year ago, I remember some experts saying that it would be eons before we even had a vaccine. And, and now here we are in a moment where there's a 
growing population of people that are vaccinated, being able to enjoy family and work and life. According to the Times, as of Sunday, about 58.9 million people have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, including about 30.7 million people who have been fully vaccinated, according to the CDC. Now, of course, there are problems. We know that there is so much injustice in vaccine distribution. Mm -hmm. People with power and money and access tend to get vaccinated first, while people without are being pushed to the back of the line. So we need to make sure that there are changes in how the vaccine is being distributed, ensuring that those who need it most are prioritized. But I don't want to lose track of the good news and the happy news about progress. Like I was saying, it's like there are still problems and there's still a little bit of a ways to go, but it's like we can see the light at the end of the tunnel when before it was even six months ago, it was like, is this ever going to end? Yeah, you know what I mean? Exactly. <laughs> and now it's like, okay, it still might be a little while before it ends, but we can see it now. I can like picture what it would be like to have a like a herd immunity. I know this is weird, but I- I'm not vaccinated yet, but I'm no. happy thinking about every time someone says that they're like, oh, I'm vaccinated. I'm like, oh, my God, thank God some people are getting it. Yeah, you know, yeah. It may not be me yet because you and I can't figure out how to. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've checked a couple of times for appointments, but they get booked so fast. So yeah. we will just keep trying. Mm hmm. And one day it'll be our turn. (laughs) Yeah. When it's the right time, (laughs) we will get it. So to everyone listening out there, I don't know, just to return to Juju's advice, the money will come, the good things will come, things will change. All you have to do is hold on if you want a chance to see better times and you just might, you just might see them. Anyway, enough about that. We need to take a little break. Okay, we're back. Now, before we continue, let me say this. If you enjoy your time with us today, make sure to subscribe to the podcast, rate it, and review it. We, Caitlin. We love reviews. We love reviews. And we love five-star ratings. Oh, we don't. So, we, we love them yeah. so much. <laughs> it's like every time I get one, I'm like, well. Wow, uh, you five. text me about it immediately. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You're like, new reviews on the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) In fact, we love reviews so much. We're going to read some of our favorite reviews at the end of the show. I mean, the likelihood that your review will be read on this podcast is very high. It's true. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So submit and we will send love right back to you. But anyway, it's time for our amazing interview. Today, our guest is Julia Tertian. She is the best-selling author of cookbooks like Now and Again, Feed the Resistance, and Small Victories, and hosts the IACP-nominated podcast, Keep Calm and Cook On. Epicurious has called her one of the 100 greatest home cooks of all time, and the New York Times has described her as being at the forefront of a new generation of authentic, approachable authors. Now her latest cookbook, Simply Julia, is receiving praise from people like Jennifer Garner, Carla Hall, and Anthony Porowski, and me on this very podcast, Caitlin. So (laughs) I'm excited to have her join us today. Everybody, I am so glad to welcome Julia Tertian to the show. And Julia, this is what I want to know first. How are you doing today? Where are you? What's going on? I am doing better right now than I've been all day because I'm getting to talk to you and I'm not just saying that. This is like (laughs) extremely exciting. I am sitting at my kitchen counter, which is my favorite place to be. Yes. I am wearing the t-shirt I slept in last night, but no one needs to see that. And (laughs) I was... I was going to take a shower and I have like super curly hair and I was like kind of excited to show you. Does that sound weird? But anyway, I never got to the shower and it's up because who knows? So I'm just being really honest. That is where I am today. Oh, and my t-shirt is my favorite bean company. (laughs) Oh, wow. Rancho Gordo. No one can see any of this. So anyway, here I am talking to you. Well, I first of all love big curly hair. For those of you who haven't seen Julia yet, she has big curly hair. It's absolutely gorgeous. Thank and you. yeah, I know that you love to be in your kitchen, which is your your safe place, your desk, your office, your, mm-hmm. you know, think tank, all of that. I'm in my little think tank. I am in 
the Bronx in a studio that has like my little curtain background mm-hmm. for Zoom calls and it has all my fan art up so I can remember mm. people love me and awesome. that I can get through my through my 2021 day. So that's where I'm at. I love that. I was wondering about your pink curtains. They're really beautiful. I didn't used to have all of this because everything I did was on the road. But then, you know, you have to turn everything upside down for the mm-hmm. pandemic because now suddenly this little space that was supposed to be a storage space is my is my stage. It's your stage. Wow. Yeah. Well, you're on your stage. I'm in my think tank. I really like that description. So Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just in our bat caves, you know. So <laughs> what's interesting is that COVID really impacted the way that you did this book. You have a brand new book, Simply Julia, and it was made during the pandemic. And you shot the photographs for it in your own home with a photographer that lived 10 minutes away. Can you tell me what it was like to embark on this project while the world was coming to an end? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, honestly, it was a gift to have something to work on and something that made me feel purposeful and ultimately makes me feel really useful. You know, like I give people recipes, (laughs) like I give people recipes for really simple things we can make at home that make us feel good. So that gave me just a wonderful sense of purpose. And yeah, in terms of the timing, I had finished the manuscript for the book. So with a cookbook, the manuscript is all the words, just none of the pictures. So all the recipes, all the stories around the recipes, introduction, all that kind of stuff. I had finished all of that and turned it in in February of 2020. And I was getting ready to do all the photography right here in my kitchen with like a big group of people who are going to help me, help me cook and take the photographs and everything. That's how I've done my previous books. You know, I've done a bunch of cookbooks. So that quickly just felt like not the best idea and right. not not super safe and also just completely unnecessary and inessential. Like it's a cookbook. It can wait. <laughs> like, yeah. So I was ready to just put it on the shelf and just come back to it when we had figured out more things, we being just the world. <laughs> and, yeah. And that was, you know, okay. And then I remembered I live, yeah, 10 minutes away from this really awesome woman who we had like emailed and stuff before, but we never met. And she is just kind of a unicorn. She is someone who's like an amazing photographer. She's also an amazing food and prop stylist, which like, I feel like I don't really know what the equivalent of all these things are in drag, but maybe someone who can like do like great makeup and make great costumes and can tell funny jokes and like, like she does all the things. Please. Um, I'm blushing. (laughs) (laughs) And so we figured it out. I called her and I was like, do you want to try and figure this out? And she was like, I think we, we should try. And so we did. And basically that meant I was making everything in my kitchen putting it in containers, labeling it, putting very detailed notes for what I wanted the pictures to look like. And then I was tucking other things into like the plastic tub, like my grandmother's plate or like a napkin. I love, you know, a little ceramic thing my wife made at summer camp that I wanted to put the little lemon wedges in, like things no one would know what they mean, but they're really important to me. And I would take that plastic tub and I would drop it off at Melina's house, like on her step, we were never in the same room. She would take it and put all the finishing touches on it. And we were just texting all day. Like, do you want the dark blue napkin or the light one? And, you know, do you want the spoon here? Do you want it there? And that's how we made all the photos of the food. And then there are a handful of pictures of me, like in my kitchen. So, you know, those happened a few months later, sort of once we figured out more kind of like COVID protocols. But yeah, most of the photos happened like, yeah, April 2020, end of March, like really, you know, early days of lockdown and all that. And The reason why I'm glad we were able to do that was not only, you know, that I got to continue working and I got to, I guess, for, you know, that month employ someone who's really creative and awesome. It also meant that the book could stay on schedule and come out now. So it's coming out, you know, basically on the year anniversary of people cooking at home more than ever. (laughs) And I just hope that it puts, I don't know, a little fun in your kitchen, a little easiness, some like non- judgmental vibes, you know, that's what I hope the book feels like. Yeah. 
Well, I've read it and I've used it. So I, I can tell you, it gives you those, uh, it definitely bring those to the table, literally. What did you make? Well, we're going to talk about it in a little okay. bit. Okay. But okay. first, I want to rewind a little bit and do uh -huh. my favorite thing, which is hear about your story from the very beginning. Sure. So I understand that you started to cook at a very, very young age. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could tell me where your passion for cooking really started yeah. and, and how. Well, I would love to tell you, but I, I don't know that I can because I honestly cannot remember. I have just truly always loved to cook since I was a really, really little kid. You know, my childhood nickname was Julia the Child. <laughs> like it's been it's been a thing for like a really I long time. <laughs> I feel like I I don't know. I, if I ever were to do drag, like that's probably who I would have to like try and embody yeah. in some way. Um, Julia Child, who just had the greatest voice. So that would be fun. Anyway, I'm digressing. Ooh, yes. um, <laughs> I was born in Manhattan to two Jewish New Yorkers. And my mother's family, before long before I ever came around, my mother's family, they originally were in Eastern Europe. They fled like during the pogroms and very long story short, they ended up in Brooklyn running a bakery, like a good old yeah. Jewish New York bakery. And so my True mom life. and my aunts, my aunts were no longer around. But I feel like based on what I know of what you do, I feel like I should send you some pictures of my aunts because they were really like glamorous and funny. And I just feel like you'd get yeah. a kick out of them. Anyway, I will put that on my mental post-it. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, they all grew up in the bakery and I never knew those grandparents. My maternal grandparents died like long before I was born. I never got to go to the bakery when it was still in our family. And I sort of feel like my love of food, there is something that feels very hereditary about it. Like very like, yeah. this isn't my first life <laughs> kind of thing. Like it feels very yeah. old and kind of like in my bones. And I think in some ways I've spent a lot of my life just sort of trying to get back to the bakery <laughs> in a certain sense. Yeah. So I've just had that. I don't know. I guess I was just born with that. And then, yeah, lived in New York. My family, when I was in middle school, we moved to the suburbs and, you know, that was fine, but maybe boring. <laughs> and then I came yeah. back to Manhattan for college and I studied poetry in college, but I always just continued this love of cooking. I just, I knew I wanted to. Same. So did I. Did you? I also studied poetry. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh, I'm like kind See of freaking out. Yeah. We've put it to use. Yeah. Exactly. Right. <laughs> Look at us now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, amazing. Amazing. Oh my gosh. That's so cool to know. I would be so curious how it has informed what you do. Because <laughs> for me, studying poetry, I feel like has actually been such a wonderful thing for my work as a cookbook author, because I'm trying to be super descriptive and also trying not to go on and on forever. <laughs> like I'm trying yeah. to be like economic with my words and like particular about yeah. them. So yeah, I did that. And then basically I just have worked on about 15 cookbooks over the years, including my own, but I, those 15 aren't all my own. I've worked with a lot of other people on their books. I've done like a lot of collaborative yeah. work and I just, I love making cookbooks and I, along the way, met my wife, Grace, and we've been married now for like seven years and we used to live, so I used to live in Manhattan and I moved in with her in Brooklyn and then Grace came with a cat and a dog. So I like to say she came with 10 legs <laughs> and I had like instant family. And then, yeah, we ended up moving outside of the city. We live in the Hudson Valley. I'm probably like two hours from where you're sitting now. And okay. we live a life I'm just really grateful to live. And I get to cook at home every day for the person who I just love so much. And we now have two dogs. And that is, you know. The most important yeah, thing. Yeah, that's kind of everything. Here at She's a Woman podcast, we are dog fans. Uh, mm. We're huge dog fans. You might hear some barking <laughs> at some point. So, <laughs> Okay, good. We love that. So it sounds like there was a lot of warmth around you cooking as a kid and you got a lot of positive responses from it. But was there a moment where you knew that it was going to be your career where you were like, this is what how I'm going to to pay the bills? Or was that just a gradual evolution? I mean, that's a really interesting question because I grew up in a home of like workaholics. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I think, I don't know that I ever considered like that I wouldn't 
have a career. And I think I always knew that I wanted to work on cookbooks. And part of that is my parents worked in publishing. I grew up basically like in the media industry. They worked in magazines. Yeah. They worked on books and in advertising too. Neither of my parents are writers, but they're, my mom was an art director and hired my dad as a graphic designer. That's how they met. <laughs> and they were for, you know, decades in the business of, and my dad continues to be, you know, in the business of putting words and images together on a page. So this is yeah. like very much what I grew up in. And I often got asked as a kid, cause I love to cook so much, you know, do you want to go to culinary school one day? Like, do you want to have a restaurant? Like it seemed like yeah. this is the linear path for a person who is interested in food, whatever their age. And I just... I don't know. I've known since I was really young, like I want to eat at restaurants, but I don't want to work at them. <laughs> um, yes. okay. um, I just, it's, it's a grueling industry and one I have so much respect for, but it's not, I'm not cut out for it and it's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in storytelling yeah. and I'm interested in making images and I'm interested in giving really clear instructions. And, you know, these are all the things I get to do as a cookbook author. So I feel like I, I guess I thought for a long time I would go into magazines. Like I thought I would kind of go into yeah. the family business. And I interned at a few magazines and it kind of hit me. I guess I was in college and it hit me because I would go to the office where, and I had been going to offices like that my whole life. That's where I would go after school to see my parents. Like right. th that wasn't new to me, but when it went from visiting my parents to me being the one walking in the door, not to see my parents, I just had this moment where I was like, oh, I don't think I want to go to the office every day. I want to have a life where I'm in my kitchen, I'm in other people's kitchens, I'm getting to travel. Like, I don't want to go to the office. Like, that felt really yeah. clear to me. And that was sort of like a light bulb moment because it felt a little like, oh, maybe I don't want to do what my parents do. But I also share yeah. all this about my parents, too, because I think that publishing is an industry where there is zero transparency and everything is really vague and nobody talks about like, how did the door open for you or like how much money you get paid or anything. So, right, you know, right. I just, I don't know. I feel like, I mean, this is my story, so I'm telling you, but also it just feels important to me to be really clear about it because I just had a lot of advantages going into this and a lot of doors were, you know, very generously propped open for me in ways they just aren't for other people. And I think that's why I try to do as much as I can in my work to just keep opening doors and like take them off the hinges. <laughs> like, why are there doors? <laughs> why? <laughs> it's interesting that you had this this moment where you knew that you were in the wrong place and you just kind of listened to your instincts. Mm -hmm. And I think that you like it's clear that you lean towards bringing comfort to people in a different way than than being a chef in a restaurant. Yeah. And this is something that I have wondered that I wanted to talk mm -hmm. to you about. What defines comfort mm. food? I know that for me, it's anything with cheese, but what is it oh, for you? I am with you. <laughs> I feel like, okay, we have poetry and cheese in common. Like, this is yes. great. I really like melted cheese on things. <laughs> um, yeah. So for me, I really appreciate what you said just now when you said, for me, comfort food is you know, cheese. I think to me, that is the definition of comfort food. It's, it's a personal definition and it's something we can all define for ourselves. And it's something that whose definition can change depending on what we're in the mood in. But I guess the easiest way for me to answer that is comfort food is whatever makes us feel comfortable, <laughs> like not just comforted, yeah. but comfortable, like, like good in our bodies, like taken care of. And for me, sometimes that is like melted cheese on, top of more cheese. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, sometimes that's like a huge crunchy salad that has like a ton of lemon and, you know, I don't know, toasted like almonds in it and stuff like that. And sometimes it's ice cream and sometimes it's lasagna and, you know, yeah. sometimes it's like roasted carrots. And it's just, for yeah. me, it's very much about being in tune with myself <laughs> and like paying attention yeah. to myself and, and being considerate of myself and just taking a moment to be like, what do you want right now? What do you need right now? Can you provide yeah. that for yourself? And then a lot of gratitude for the ability to do that. One of the realizations that you have in the book or that you talk about in the book is sort of in line with this comfort and the good feeling of food, you realize that eating healthy does not mean feeling bad about yeah. your body 
and forcing yourself to suffer because of it. You know, feeling bad about your body isn't healthy. In fact, when we feel bad about our bodies, the only benefit is that corporations make more money off of us, which is the, you know, ding, ding, ding. Yeah. So can you talk about your, your definition of health? Sure. Because sure. I think that's really interesting and how you, you think about your body yeah. differently, you know, I, I, I so appreciate you asking me about this because it's it's really important to me. And, you know, I wrote a book of healthy comfort food. You know, I wrote a book that has healthy as a word in the subtitle, and it is not about weight loss. It is not about right. restriction or deprivation of any kind. And it is not a book where, uh, you know, the word healthy is used in place of the word skinny. <laughs> and right. That feels hugely important to me because, and from a very personal place, because I used to confuse the two. I thought they were synonyms and they're not like they just, they do not mean the same thing. And so for me, yeah, I guess I'll tell you how I define healthy, but then maybe a bit about whatever, I'll tell you that and wherever it goes. So I define healthy exactly as you said, it's not really about what I eat or when I eat. It's completely about how I feel when I'm eating. It's about feeling free, most of all. It's about feeling free from judgment, not only from other people, but from myself. And it's about yeah. feeling free from guilt and, you know, any of these really negative and toxic things that, as you said so perfectly, like, are just not good for us, like physically or yeah. mentally or emotionally. And the reason that it feels super important to me to put it in those terms and to share it in the book. And again, to encourage us all to define it for ourselves, because I do not think one size fits all. And just as you said, I think a lot, a lot, a lot of people and many millions and billions of dollars are spent telling us otherwise about all this. You know, it just, it feels important to me because I didn't always feel this way. Like I, you know, as I mentioned, I used to really confuse healthy and skinny. And that meant that for my whole life, as much as I've loved cooking, which I've, you know, gotten to tell you about, like from such a young age, like I've always had this yeah. deep curiosity in the kitchen. I've always felt my most confident in the kitchen. Like this is the place, like I'm sitting in my kitchen right now, I'm looking around at like my tools and my sink and stuff. Like this is the place where like I know I can figure things out. <laughs> like this is the yeah. place where I can provide like for myself, for my wife, for my friends, for my family. Like this is the place where I feel most grounded, calm, like all these really, really wonderful things. And that's been a through line in my life. And wow, am I lucky to have that in my life. But at the same yeah. time, on the other hand, I have not felt those things when it's come to eating. You know, I've right. loved to cook and I've felt often really scared about eating and I've felt guilty and I have felt like I was failing because I wasn't a certain size or, you know, whatever my scale told me or however my pants fit or blah, blah, blah. And I just basically got really tired of that. And I also started to believe my wife when she essentially was like inviting me to look at myself through her eyes, which was a very generous you know, yeah. offer. And I also just came to understand like what diet culture is. Like, I didn't know it was a thing. And, you know, yeah. I think most people listening probably know what it is, but just for the sake of like having us all on the same page, like diet culture is the culture we live in. <laughs> and, you know, it's yeah. the culture that you're talking. So, you know, like helpfully about, about like how many people profit off of it. Like it's an industry, but it's also our culture. It's like what we're told. It's what we're told in, you know, all different types of media and what we're told by our friends and family and ourselves and all of that. Yeah. And I think what we're told over and over is that like the most important thing to aim for is to be thin. And like the worst thing you can be is fat. And if you are not trying to lose weight, like you're doing something wrong and you are basically like only valuable if you take up a really small amount of space. And that is just like really, I don't know, bogus. <laughs> and yeah. So yeah, that is kind of where I was. And I'm now just really, really happy to be, I don't know, sitting in my kitchen, getting to talk to you about this in a way that feels really like, I feel very relaxed talking about this. Like this used to make me yeah. feel really nervous and anxious. And right. I just 
don't anymore. And that feels really good. And it feels really wonderful to share, especially in something that has the word healthy on it. I love what you said about seeing yourself through your wife's Mm -hmm. eyes and not looking at, you know, with your own eyes, which are always the most critical. Sure. And it it just reminded me, Caitlin and I, my co-pilot, Caitlin and I have this rule that we follow where if I'm talking about myself, I'm like, I've gained all this weight. Mm -hmm. I'm just sitting around the house doing nothing. I'm so unhealthy. I'm so sedentary. I look awful, blah, blah, blah. She always says to me or vice versa, like, is that the tone that you would talk to your sister in? Exactly. Yeah. You know? (laughs) And so, and so we just had this rule, like, like, think of one of your loved ones and would you look at them with those eyes? Would you talk to them in that way? Would that be, no, that's not, that's not how it would be. So don't do it to yourself. Yeah. I'm really glad you have that in your life. I imagine just from what I've gathered from television and stuff, like, I mean, that's such a huge part of your work and stuff. And I just can't imagine how hard that must be at times. Being in front of a a camera all the time is really, I think it's hard, but I think that it's something that in the age of Instagram, everybody knows about, Mm -hmm. I think, because Mm -hmm. you're always in pictures, your own pictures, other people's pictures, and you're looking at yourself. Another thing that you are passionate about in your book is and that I didn't when you I wasn't excited about it when I first read it okay. but then when I tried out a recipe I totally got it and it's about ease mm. and in your all of your recipes I was just shocked at how few pans and utensils they use and you really explain in your book that this is a book for human beings that live in the actual world that have a limited fridge, limited time, l- limited sink space. So can you talk about like how that passion came up for sure. you? Because And then I'll talk a little bit about cooking from your book. Yeah, no, I like cannot wait to hear what you made. And also just the way you asked that question, I feel like there was so much suspense and I was like, oh gosh, <laughs> like, what, yeah. what's it going to be? And I'm so happy it's about easy, like things that have ease. So yes, I am, as I feel like I've been a broken record saying, I am a home cook. And that means I am someone who, when I make anything, I am not just cooking dinner. I'm also, or whatever meal, I'm not just cooking. I'm I'm planning for it. I'm figuring out the groceries. I'm figuring out what's in the fridge that needs to be used up. I'm figuring out what I froze however many months ago that I forgot about and I should probably use because yeah. I don't want to throw All it right. out. I am also cleaning up after this whole adventure. And I am getting ready to do it all over again in like a few hours or the next day. And there is just a lot of labor and a lot of unvalued, is that a word? (laughs) Not valued enough labor that comes with being a home cook. And there's a lot of just skill and thoughtfulness that's involved that just goes so unacknowledged. And I, that is me. That is what I do. And that's what so many other people do. And So I'm a home cook who writes for other home cooks. I'm not a restaurant chef who has someone else preparing ingredients and a, a, you know, a dishwasher, both like a person who washes dishes and like major machines that do it. Um, I mean, I have a dishwasher. I'm looking at it. I'm so grateful. Living here is like the first (laughs) time in my adult life I've had one. It's made a big difference in my career. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Yeah. And... Anyway, so I just feel like I want to just acknowledge all that labor and effort and thoughtfulness because it goes so often without any like just, I don't know, applause. And I just think it deserves applause. But most of all, yeah, I'm a home cook who writes for other home cooks. So if you can get away with using one bowl for a recipe instead of two or three, like I will never tell you to use the two or three. Like I'll never tell you to use an extra pan if you don't need one. Because I don't want to wash any of those things. I don't think you do either. And most importantly, I feel like easy to me is part of my definition of healthy and my definition of comfort. You know, this book is healthy comfort. Like I put those two words together on purpose because I think they have a lot to do with each other, at least for me personally. And, you know, so it means on just like a logistic level, like I use a nonstick pan in so many of my recipes, like Yes, that means you can use maybe some less oil in your cooking. 
but also it's like right. so much easier to clean. Like, and that to me is why I use it. It has nothing to do with like the amount of fat or anything. It's because I, right. I just don't want to be standing at my sink for as long <laughs> as I'm eating, you know? And right. that to me means that healthy comfort food is just a lot easier to do and more accessible, which is to me just as it should be. So thank you for asking about ease. It's something that's very, very important to me. The reason that I, that I asked about it is because I, I made your roast chicken with onion gravy. Ooh, good choice. And the way that everything flows together, first of all, the onion gravy is not your typical gravy. It's made with a sour cream, so you skip a lot of steps. It's very instant. The way that everything flows together and the there's so few utensils mm -hmm. used and so few pans used, it's all goes from the oven to the stovetop. And it was delicious. Mm, I'm so happy to hear that. While I was cooking from your book, I realized what you were talking about bringing into people's homes, which was just this no sweat, comfortable, happy experience. And that isn't when the plate arrives on the table. That's through the whole process yeah. from cooking to knowing that you have only one pan in the sink to the flavors and everything. So I just wanted to tell you that I, that I tried it and that I, from trying it, I got what you were saying. Mm, so that means a lot to me. Yeah. Oh, of course. If you're listening to this, there's, this book is so wonderful. Again, it's called Simply Julia and it is full of recipes like this that just flow so easily and it helps you understand what you should be doing while something else is, is boiling. And it is a wonderful companion for the 2021 pandemic. So just give it a try. Thank you. It's also a very personal book. And I think that it's so beautiful how you share stories from your marriage and your life with each recipe. And those memories make the food richer. I wanted to talk to you about being openly queer. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to work in publishing and I helped sell cookbooks. Oh. And I know that it is the most cutthroat because there are so many cookbooks mm -hmm. coming out all the time. And I was wondering, you know, you, you always want to be like the most marketable. What made you want to be 100% out mm. and tell your full story through your books? Yeah, I have just so many questions about like, you're studying poetry and marketing cookbooks and stuff. And I just, I, I like want to interview you on my podcast so I can ask you all the questions. But in terms of being openly queer in my books, which I very much am, it feels so important to me. And the reason why is because, as I mentioned, I grew up around so many books and magazines. I taught myself to cook by reading cookbooks and by watching public television and, you know, watching Julia Child and <laughs> all that. I never in my experience, I may have read a cookbook written by a gay woman. That is very possible, but that was never clear to me. I never read a cookbook that within the recipes, the woman writing the cookbook or the man writing the cookbook for that matter, the person writing the cookbook was writing kind of love notes to their significant other. And I often think about, you know, at age whatever, 12, 14, 17, however old, like what would it have meant to me to see that? I feel like your work in television and on screens and stuff, like you probably understand representation and visibility in so many more nuanced ways than I do. And I know it's such a big thing that, you know, you and so many of your colleagues talk about and what it's meant for people to see, to see just you on television. You know, I know right. what it's meant. I told you my wife is like your biggest fan. Like I know what it's meant for her to watch you and so many other people on television. And, you know, for me, I was a young kid who wasn't interested in pursuing drag, but I have loved cookbooks and right. I did not, you know, as much as I saw white people like myself represented, I just, I never saw an openly queer woman represented. Yeah. And, I feel like I have the ability to bring my full self to my work, to talk about my wife all the time, to dedicate my books to her, to have pictures of us in the books. I get to bring my full self to my work because a lot of people didn't get to do that. And I want to take full advantage of that and not just to celebrate my home kitchen, which is a home kitchen that feeds two women <laughs> who are married to each other. Um, yeah. 
I wanted to do that because I think it's really important because cookbooks tell us a lot about who we are and who we are right now. Yeah. You know, and if you look back in, you know, history, a lot of people go to like textbooks and history books and I go to cookbooks, you know, they tell you about what was available, what ingredients were available. They, they tell you yeah. a lot of stories like, you know, there's information about just everything, like the spices available in a recipe tell you about the spice trade, <laughs> you know, like they tell you yeah. about history. And I just want my books to reflect who I am because I think that who I am is a result of everyone who came before me and they made it possible for me to just be super gay in my books. <laughs> and I feel yeah. really grateful for that. And, you know, when I first started doing my own books, as I mentioned, it came after doing a lot of collaborative work. So I went into my own books knowing what it is to make a cookbook, but I had never promoted one. And yeah. when I promoted my first book, everything we're talking about right now really hit me in a way I just, I didn't anticipate. And I just have had so many just really truly meaningful moments across the country in bookstores and stuff like that with just so many queer people and especially young women. And I've had moments with young women and their mothers, <laughs> like telling them what it means to me to see, you know, my marriage reflected in a book they can both enjoy and both find really accessible. Like cookbooks yeah. come into people's homes in a way not every type of media does. Like they're very welcomed. They feel very familiar. Yeah. And that's why I like to treat them as basically like Trojan horses. Like I slip a lot of stuff into <laughs> yes! mine where I'm like, oh, you didn't see this coming. And I once had a colleague describe it as like sheet pan chicken with like a side of social justice. <laughs> and like, it's very yeah, like, and they're powerful. Yeah. Right. You know, there's not a pride flag on the cover of my books, like which would be fine with me. But, yeah. you know, it means like it might not be so obvious. But once you get in there, it kind of seeps in. And I feel like cookbooks have this power to normalize things that have been othered. And I just I really want to just use that power for every, you know, way I can, because I just I think it's it would be irresponsible not to. There's a beautiful picture of you and your wife eating outside at a table. and. You know, you're right. Cookbooks make things just look like it just looks like you want to be there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's so it's so beautiful and human. And to see uh, queer people enjoying beautiful human moments is always going to be gorgeous to me. Yeah. And Thank that you. that brings to mind your work as an activist. You recognize the, that the food industry is plagued with racism, sexism, homophobia, and much more. Mm -hmm. So you helped create a huge directory called Eat Equity at the Table, which features and supports only women or gender non-conforming individuals in or around the food industry. And it focuses primarily on people of color and the queer community. Can you talk about what this directory is for our listeners and uh, how it came about? Sure. You know, it's interesting because I just like, I never use the word activist to describe myself. I mean, I appreciate what <laughs> you just said, but I don't know. I just feel like that belongs to people who are just on the front lines of things every day. And I, I mean, I'm on the front line of my kitchen <laughs> and, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I just feel very invested in like, you know, making just things open and accessible for people. So you can call me anything. I just feel like that's important to clarify. And yeah. in terms of eat, you know, easy to remember, eat with two T's. It really, to me, falls in line with a lot of the work I do. You know, I write recipes for a living. I give like clear, tangible tools and resources for people. And that's exactly what Equity at the Table is. It's a database. I started it almost three years ago with the input and support of like an amazing advisory board and the input and support and generosity of an amazing web developer who understands things way better than I do when it comes to the back end of this stuff. And it is just a really clear and easy to use, easy to search database. It's exactly what you said. It features, you know, only people who identify as women and gender non-conforming individuals. We focus primarily on the queer community and people of color. And it's just an incredibly useful tool. Like if you're in a position to hire someone or feature someone, like let's say, I don't know, you want an event catered or you're a magazine editor looking to write an article or you're writing a cookbook and you're going to hire a photographer, like you can go yeah. to eat and find people. And it's also a place for all the members to find each other and to create, you know, just a really important community. Yeah. 
Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a really beautiful thing. Thank you. Well, so that brings me to my final question. <gasps> oh my gosh. Flew by. Which I always, yeah, right? <laughs> Just, oh I always want to ask of my, of my people. By the way, you said that you had wonderful connections with mothers and their daughters mm -hmm. throughout at bookstores throughout the country. And I have to tell you that that is exactly my experience. Those are my people mm -hmm. too. Whenever I have a meet and greet, it's mothers and daughters. So mm -hmm. for all the mothers and daughters right. listening, isn't it amazing for being there? <laughs> we, we love you. Yeah, it's, and, it's amazing. And for me also Jewish mothers and daughters, oh, yeah. especially. Yeah. So <laughs> I think we're on the same circuit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we, <laughs> So you guys, I'm telling you, we have the same audience. If you like me, you'll like her and vice versa. So <laughs> totally, totally. But uh, what, what I want to know is what's on the back burner now? What's your next dream that is oh. sort of percolating in your head? Oh, you know, I could tell. Well, I, could, I, 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 well, I have a plan, I guess, because so I am one of the, I would say, incredibly, incredibly lucky and rare people who has known what they wanted to do their entire life. And I've gotten to do it. Like I've always wanted to work on cookbooks. I've gotten to work on so many. I've gotten to make so many. And so I have lately been going through what I think, I guess people go through at all different points in life, but I think a lot of people go through when they're younger than I am, which is like, what do I want to do now? <laughs> um, yeah. So I am having such a good time talking about this book with people like yourself and putting it out in the world. And then starting a few weeks from now, I'm spending the rest of the year working on the crew at my friend's farm. That's 10 minutes away. And I'm going to help grow and clean and harvest and sell vegetables. So I'm going to do that. And then I'll see what's oh, wow. next after that. So yeah, that's the plan. That's amazing. Yeah. That's really incredible. I've been like, I've been on like a research hole about work boots. <laughs> I can't decide. <laughs> <laughs> that online shopping it's, oh, well, it will get you God. forever. <laughs> but I want to thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your story. Again, one more time for everybody. Simply Julia is available now and it is a wonderful companion if you are a if you are a person that became a cook in 2020. Here's a great way to level up. Thank you so much, Julia. And I hope that we'll be talking to you soon. Thank you so much for having me. I love the way you just described it. I totally f feel that. And I just really thank you for your time and these wonderful questions. This was really meaningful. So thank you. Okay, Caitlin, you were just paging through the cookbook. What do you think of the pictures? I was. It's so nice. And I thought listening to her talk, she's so like automatically likable. Oh, you know what I mean? It's crazy. She's really likable. Yeah. I really liked her saying that she feels like she learns about history through cookbooks, which is just something I've never thought about before, but she's right. Even just looking at anything, even a cookbook from a different era can really teach you a lot about what things were like. Yeah. And for our listeners, you didn't get to hear because we had ended the interview already, but they held up their dogs for oh, us to see. They held up their two dogs and they were so cute. <laughs> and they looked so confused. I know. They were like, why are we being picked up and held to this <laughs> computer? <laughs> oh, so yeah. Julia Tertian and her wife, Grace. And, what and I'm looking through the book right now and... I want to make on oh, cooking and anxiety is a chapter. Oh, it's wow. so great. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And just so easy to use, like I said. So I really love that interview. And I hope that all of you grab the book and make yourself some of these wonderful, tasty gravy and cheese laden. I know foods. I'm going to have to borrow this from you, you know. Oh, yeah. I know. <laughs> and I'm going to make you some chili, Caitlin. That's we right. got some spices. <laughs> so anyway. Before we close out, I have to say this. If you liked your time with us today, make sure to subscribe to the podcast, rate it, and review it. Like we said at the beginning, we love reviews. In fact, we love them so much. We're going to read some of our favorite reviews right here at the end of the show. Caitlin. Yes. <laughs> Caitlin, do you have a favorite review this week? I do. This one is titled... Miss Cracker is the new Terry Gross. I'm blown away by the quality of interviews that Miss Cracker does. I sit here intrigued by the stories she gets her guests to tell that I had no idea I'd ever 
find interest in. Hello, a new translation of Beowulf. She's a natural and she seamlessly weaves the conversations together into something both enjoyable and meaningful. It's so refreshing to have someone celebrating the accomplishments of women from all walks of life. Yay! That's and so I know wonderful. you really love that one. That's a really nice one. And yeah. they compared you to Terry Gross, which is like your hero, you yep, know? Yeah, that's absolutely right. <laughs> like, ideally on this podcast, ideally, I would interview Terry Gross. Right. Oh, just, well, right? put it on our bucket list. Put it you on know? our bucket list. We're going <laughs> to have that Environmental Protection Agency lady. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And we're definitely going to have Terry Gross. Okay. So anyway, that, that review makes me very, very happy. So leave your reviews and there will be a chance that they get read on here. But first, it's time for us to take a little break. Okay, we're back. And Caitlin, now it is time for the credits. You know how I love them. Your favorite part. <laughs> did you have fun today? I did have fun today. It was you, a good one. Yeah. You know it was like a warm day and you're not a fan of warm days. Yeah, it's still like cool enough mixed in with the warm but i'm not totally miserable yet but yep. check in on me again in august and you know. we're having quality time caitlin <laughs> that's right <laughs> so, this podcast was produced by caitlin who's sitting right next to me <laughs> and then i did it the cast includes me and also caitlin who as i said is here <laughs> and it is distributed by the amazing Studio 71. So thank you for joining us today. Make sure to tune in next Monday for another exciting episode. And remember, if you ever feel down, all you have to do is look in the mirror and say, She's, She's a, a woman! woman! And I'll be with you. Oh, Kayla, those were such nice dogs we saw today. I know, they were so nice. <laughs> like nice and scared in the eyes, but so fuzzy. And <laughs> I know. And like mutts, you know. Mutt, oh, <laughs> mutt central. <laughs> uh, uh.